So it's also the seventh uh, BDF session. It's called uh, So Near Future From Now On. And I'm super delighted to have everybody here. And um, I just wanted to say that Brighton Digital Festival was set up 10 years ago um, by uh, Wide Sussex, Clear Left and Lighthouse. And it's really nice to sort of have it back uh, for its 10th year for us to deliver it. Um, we've been doing a project with Tech Amnesty where people have been donating their phones and computers and laptops and we've got crates and crates of stuff and this is really important for future iterations of the festival. It means that more people can enjoy the activities and the stuff that we're putting on in the future. So check out Tech Take Back because they can take your unwanted devices, clean them up and um, we can share them across the city. Um, so, <coughs> without further ado, I'm just going to hand over to, basically, it's like my dream dinner people at a <laughs> table. Um, Violetta said this on comms recently and I was like, she knows my mind. But anyway, I'm going to go this way around. We've got David Blandy, <laughs> dear friend of Lighthouse, of Brighton Digital Festival, lives in Brighton. People are going to introduce themselves. It's much better rather than me reading their biogs. <laughs> um, we've got Amal Saeed, who's a fantastic artist and has been doing great work with us for the last year and a half. And it's really great to see your work in, in real life. Um, it's at Enter Gallery. It's the last night tonight. So if you're, as you're leaving our closing party, you can walk by Bond Street and see the work um, before we take it down. And then behind me on screen is a Fatu Niobe. Can you wave? <laughs> it's great to have you here. You're, from, um, you're in Berlin at the moment, but uh, we've been showing Ifati's work, uh, Ancestral Wisdoms at Lighthouse. It's a really beautiful piece, and you'll hear more about that. We've got Benga Adelikan, who is a superstar, rock star, musician, but he's also an artist and has made this awesome graphic, this graphic novel. And um, he did that in lockdown with his brother, Shay. And we're going to hear a bit more about that. And then finally, it's going to be chaired by Elijah, who's just like our lighthouse hero. And um, <laughs> <laughs> did a fantastic project called um, Last Dance for 18 months. And it's just great that we're still continuing to work together. Enough from me already. Enjoy this. It's going to be fantastic. And I can't wait to sort of think about the past, think about the present, and how we can go forward for the next iterations of the festival. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, thank you, Ali. Can everyone hear me? Mike's yep. good? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm Elijah. I'm just going to chair, kind of guide the conversation. Um, everyone's going to talk about their work, um, what they've done for Brighton Digital Festival, what we've been doing for the last 18 months, and kind of bounce off each other. Um, we'll take questions at the end. If there's something super pressing that you need to say when um, someone's talking, just like maybe put your hand up and I'll maybe find my way to you. Um, and yeah, we're just going to kind of keep it loose. It's Sunday afternoon, uh, there's drinks, and let's, um, let's go. So um, we'll go Benga first, and then we'll go around <coughs> and if you talk about your work and how we got here on Sunday. Yeah. Cool. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Benga. I, my day job is playing bass guitar in a band called Metronomy, um, but I during lockdown, well, firstly, Ali is an old friend of mine, and thank you very much to the festival for kind of organizing this, because it's going to be a super fun conversation. And uh, yeah, during lockdown, my brother and I wrote a short story that got turned into this kind of illustrated uh, book. Uh, and so writing, writing stories is something that I've been doing since before I was actually kind of making music seriously. Um, and I guess, like everybody else, when I suddenly found myself trapped at home, it's like, hey, I know, I'm going to pick up this thing that I've not done for a long time and kind of rekindle my love of whatever it was. You know, like I've got friends who suddenly rediscovered the love of carpentry or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, for me and my brother, we wrote a story together. Um, and if you don't mind, I will read a little snippet of it now. So the idea also, a lot of what I do in my non-metronomy stuff, uh, 
like outside of the kind of indie rock world is looking for ways to take, I'm, I'm from Nigeria, looking for ways to take my kind of Nigerian heritage and place it in a contemporary context or place it in a kind of futuristic context. And so the idea of this story is it's set in a world where colonialism didn't happen and Western countries just kind of continued to trade with countries in South America, countries in kind of Africa, Australia, and the kind of the rate of technological advancement was kind of equal everywhere in the world. So you didn't have this massive kind of resource extraction and slavery. Um, so in this world, Nigeria, what used to be what we know as Nigeria is still three separate kind of ethnic kingdoms. So the story is set in Yoruba land, which is the kind of southeastern bit of, sorry, southwestern bit of what is today Nigeria. And they've built a massive solar field that powers about, provides about one third of the world's energy. So you kind of, that's what we need to know as a kind of backdrop. And it's the story, the story is about a boy, kind of a seven or eight year old boy and his relationship with his mom and his friends at school. So back then, before everything that happened, I dreamed of working at the field. It made mommy smile when I said that. Dad would always come with something like, you know, mommy could have done any job she wanted and you have plenty of time to make your mind up, Dakwa. I tried to imagine being a remote surgeon like him. Sometimes he would call me into a study and show me a live feed from a robot before they wheeled a patient in. Or he'd tell me stories about surgery with all the gruesome bits left in, trying to appeal to my boyish delight in the secretions and squelches of the human body. It's almost painful to remember how hard he tried when he must have known there was no way to compete with mummy. Surgery was something done from home and safety, remotely overseeing a robot in a dark room somewhere. Mummy was out in the sun and the dust, protecting Yoruba land with her sweat. Every morning as I walked through the gate of Kingdoms College, I saw the school crest, a huge Gelede mask framed by the proverb, lack of wisdom in youth is imbecility in adulthood. To this day, I still don't know what that means. So much space in my brain is taken up by these proverbs, like the rabbit that eats yams and enjoys them will return for more. That's a good one. Or, the journey is never so pleasant that the parrot does not return home. I could go on. We all had to learn them, each one a little longer and more complicated than the last, year after year, until we graduated high school. Yorubas were famous for their adamantine memories. It's part of what made us great. My friend Kemi laughed at it, like she did at so much else. She understood that feats of human memory were pointless when everybody had a quantum pad. <laughs> so we'll come back to you. Right? We'll, yeah. we'll we'll kind of go around. So Fatu, do you want to um, kind of introduce yourself and explore your work? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Elijah, and thank you, Wenga, for that beautiful passage. I'm also Nigerian, so that really struck a chord. Um, I'm not Yoruba, I'm Igbo, but we also have super, super, duper long, complicated proverbs that sometimes you think don't make any sense, um, but they do. Um, but anyway, hi everyone else. My name is Ifatu. It's really great to be here. I live in Berlin. I'm a filmmaker and photographer, and my work usually explores connections. My project at the festival is called Ancestral Wisdoms, and it's an AI interactive piece that allows you to ask an ancestor an, a question. And the aim of the project is really to get people to start thinking about connections, kind of like, um, I think actually really similar to Wenga's work. Um, it's about heritage, um, where do people come from, especially people who are in the diaspora, and um, people who are really trying to explore the connections to where they come from. It's really something that is supposed to invoke reflecting on this question. And I'm really excited to be here and to have this conversation with all the amazing people on stage. Thank you. Hey. Cool. Come on. 
Hey, um, I'm Amal, Amal Saeed. Um, I'm a, I started as a poet, uh, but my main kind of work now is as a photographer. And I'm also dabbling in film. So <laughs> this project for Brighton Digital Festival was a cool way for me to experiment. Um, and yeah, to feel really supported, you know, while dabbling. <laughs> um, but so I say that I, I started as a, as a poet because I was really nosy. I'll say that, I was nosy. Like my mum would be on the phone to like family members in Kenya or in Denmark. and there'd always be some kind of like intriguing conversation happening. And so my, my thing was, oh, what's going on here, right? Like, who's that? And what's their name? And what's the story? And so naturally just fell into writing and naturally fell into having conversations um, like that. Um, and so this project that I did for Brighton Digital Festival just feels so kind of, it's just so me. Um, it was about, <laughs> it was about <laughs> asking questions of people um, about their memories um, of photo albums, of you know having moved to other places, because I think a lot of us can relate. Like a lot of us are not in the same place as a lot of the people that we love. Um, you know, they're in a different continent or they're you know somewhere else. And <laughs> the ocean there. Okay. <laughs> um, so a lot of us kind of hold on to things, right? So for me, I hold on to photographs, and we a lot of us a lot of the times we had family members from Kenya send um, photography over. And we also used to record videos of ourselves, or my parents were like, kind of get in a line, I'm gonna take a video, we're gonna send it to, um, you know, back home. Um, so like, there's a huge part of my childhood that is, you know, connected to all these people that I don't know. And so I really wanted to explore that. So the project is called, If I Could Get To You. And um, it was bringing together old family footage. It was bringing together voice notes. I know we said something about like voice notes and connection earlier. Um, and I also had like a conversation with my dad for the first time. Um, we have a really formal relationship. So like, hey, you all right? I'm good. Yeah, you. <laughs> so, so for this project, I thought, let me sit down with him and like, let me actually have like a proper conversation and ask him questions about his memories of his family. And so much came out that I, I, I didn't know before, which is cool. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> right, um, thanks, Amal. <laughs> Yeah, I'm David, uh, David Blandy. I'm a, um, I guess, video artist, performance artist, and a game maker. I've been thinking about uh, the self in the digital space for, God, like, since the Amstrad <laughs> CPC 6128 with built-in disk drive. But um, <laughs> it's... <laughs> um, Recently, that's turned into, especially, I mean, yeah, it's, it, bizarrely, it started before, before the pandemic. Um, I started working on a project around um, role-playing games, around, like, the, the space of Dungeons and & Dragons and um, the imagina imaginative space that you create together with people around a table. So you're just telling a story that, you know, nothing exists. It's just you saying to another person, oh, um, I don't know, I want to approach this door, and then they say, well, the door's locked, like, what do you do? Like, it's kind of like really tropey sort of space, but somehow it creates a really vivid space in the mind. And I found after kind of working in the, visual, the kind of virtual space for so long, thinking about video games and, um, and kind of 3D, working with VR headsets, that somehow this, this imaginary space was somehow really powerful, like the, the kind of four people around a table could create this space between themselves that um, could help you both kind of have a really strong sense of empathy, like you really get into another character, but also really kind of have this incredible like resolution, because uh, thinking in kind of digital terms, like really high res graphics, but with no video card, it's just your brains. And I found, yeah, that, really quite exciting. So I started working on this project where um, I imagined that, like, yeah, the climate cataclysm has happened. Like, the population of Earth has um, escaped into underground havens. And the Earth, this is my little sci-fi bit, uh, has released this thing called Essence, which um, induces sort of gene changes and it, it, speeds up evolution. So each, each of these havens kind of evolves in a different way depending on the flora and fauna around it. Um, and we become post-human. And then 8,000 years later, these capsules start being opened up and people start exploring the surface world and the, the world is re-greened because humanity hasn't been there. So, and 
Um, so I've been working with lots of different spaces. It started in uh, Canby Island, Canby Wick, that's what inspired it. It was a space that um, had been due to be a uh, oil reserve, but in the 1970s there was the oil crash and it um, got left to nature. And for the last 40 years it's been rewilding and now it's one of the most biodiverse spaces in the UK. So it's sort of like, you know, this, this kind of healing can happen naturally if we let it. So, um, yeah, so it started there. I've been investigating spaces in like Cambridgeshire, in um, Northampton, but um, I thought it'd be interesting to work with Brighton. So for the Brighton Digital Festival, uh, just met up with a group of, of fellow um, explorers. <laughs> And um, we thought up, like, uh, what could Brighton be like? But then also as a counterpoint, what, could, what would the colony on Mars that was set up by the elite, you know, the kind of Bezos, etc., like, instead of going into the underground havens, they shot up to Mars and set up this colony. They terraformed, and it's kind of failing now, and, like, they're having to come back and try and colonize Earth. So it's sort of like, it comes like this, this kind, of, kind of whole back and forth thing. Um, thinking about um, histories of colonization and um, how we resist all, all that horrible stuff. So yeah, there's there's where 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 I am. Um, it's yeah, it's all part of like the lost eons thing. Got it here. <laughs> but um, what I've created for the Brighton Digital Festival is is like a little. It's called like a pocket place. It's like A7 little thing. You unfold it and it's kind of you have a map and you have um, prompts to create um, a space at your role play table. Sorry, thanks. <laughs> like across all your work, I kind of think um, optimism is kind of like embedded within it, even though there's like kind of dystopian things happen in your work and your work. But like historically, I felt like digital was always meant dystopian <laughs> and dark and like no future. And but across all this work, it feels like everyone is like positive even after last year. Like, how, how did you guys kind of find some sort of like joy or positivity and like able to get to a point where you can, you know, enjoy like even seeing like a good future? I think there's still a feeling that like another world is possible, I guess. Um, and so, yeah, like the story I wrote with my brother, it was imagining just the slightest of tweaks to kind of history and actually, you know, it's like course correcting a ship or something. It's like you just change it a couple of degrees and before you know it, you're headed off somewhere pretty different. It's like, even if like with the climate situation, we're like very close to a point of no return, it's like still possible to change things, I think. And so I think it's that, yeah, that feeling of possibility and I guess when you enter the realm of um, imagining things, it's like, well, yeah, like it's all, it all begins with thinking that things are possible and that's the kind of jumping off point for kind of making them happen, I guess. Yeah, I, I really agree with um, what Wenger has said. I, I think in my work, I'm really curious about what happened in the past because I feel like everything we're facing today my ancestors have faced similar things, but somehow humanity continues because we have hope that there's gonna be a better future and we keep trying. And that's why I'm really curious in looking at the past and seeing what people did and trying to imagine like, oh, how would they build the situation that I'm in today? Or can I see something that they did that maybe I can apply into my life today? And that's really like where I draw optimism from. I feel like if we were to be really real and start looking at, you know, the situation of our lives, um, it could get pretty dark, you know, like easily. <laughs> so it's nice to, I, I think looking at the past even gives you a chance to romanticize what has come before. I mean, it, it probably was not that rosy, but, you know, we can use our imagination and create the realities that we, we want to believe. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Fatu. Um, I think it's also, it's been a huge part of just my raising. It's, it's like people have it worse than you, right? It's like there have been tragedies and, you know, other people have gone through much worse. So kind of 
just kind of think about the other side of it. It's, it's what's keeping you alive. You know, there are things that you can find joy in in that way. But also um, knowing that for me specifically, like you ask kind of where's the joy or, you know, what do you do? What do you hold on to? But um, when I, when kind of in the middle of a pandemic, say like when there's no work and it's really difficult to create art, you know, because, you know, there's no money um, or, um, you know, my parents need help filling out like a bunch of forms because they've both lost their jobs. It's like, it's really, really difficult. It's like, how do I continue to create? How do I continue to do this? You know, thinking about like the material <laughs> things that are missing. Um, and, and for me, it's um, daily. I, I just began to like adopt this practice of writing down things that I was still grateful for that were still in my life. Um, and I started going on daily walks and just kind of being in the earth and kind of being like, thinking about it just in a really physical way. Like I saw a tree today <laughs> and it was really beautiful. Like it's still standing there, you know? And um, so those are the things that kind of kept me going. And um, because I think like when I think about this project, um, I, I think about like what came before it and what came before it was a huge period of just not creating at all. And so this was the kind of this marks for me um, coming back to art or coming back to like myself as like an artist and believing in myself in that way as an artist. Um, so yeah, this, this project does, it means all, all of those things for me. But um, I look at also other artists and like to see what they're creating. Um, and also all the things that came out, like you said, you know, the, the work came out of, you know, that period, which is incredible. Um, and for me also collaboration as well came out of that. So during the pandemic, finding other artists that were also struggling in the same ways that I was struggling and um, having those conversations and then writing together or um, taking pictures together or you know, even through Zoom, <laughs> that became a thing. <laughs> um, so yeah, collaboration, like leaning on each other, I think, I, I think of, yeah. Yeah, I think um, optimism is a strategy, really. It's, it's a way, it, and I think it's quite a radical thing to do, because <laughs> it's, it's kind of a natural state, is just to think, like, change is impossible, and we just have to live in this space and um, just bear it. And you have to imagine that there's a better world that we can actually change things. And sometimes that's hard to do, especially... Um, I don't know with yeah current administration etc. But it's <coughs> it's like, but I think you know one thing the pandemic showed was like you know if the will is there, things can change really radically over, overnight. It's yeah. just the will isn't there. So now it's 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 getting in motion those um, those kind of processes that that can actually you know affect affect change and re really make things make things more more concrete. I mean, I, th I think the creative act is, is necessarily optimistic because it's like it's imagining that someone's going to be interested or relate to what you're what you're doing in this moment. And um, you know, I go into every project. I I don't know what the end point is going to be. <laughs> like you have to persuade someone that it's going to be a good idea that, that they support you in doing this thing or something. But you don't know what it's going to be. But you have to have that optimism that it's going to it's going to work out. It's all going to be fine, guys. So, <laughs> so, and, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and with that, you kind of, yeah, you kind of, the anxiety ebbs and you realise that things can, can be affected. And if you can change this, maybe you can change that. So. Were there things that happened like last year that were so extreme that you felt like your imaginations in these projects needed to be dialed up? Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's more like, I was talking to my brother about this, where in that, like, often with kind of dark sci-fi, it's like you're, you're looking at this dystopian future, but, like, we were in this situation where we're kind of in a dystopian present. So it's like, it's actually imagining, imagining a future that's also dystopian is not that interesting in a way, because there are so many, there were so many things about the kind of lockdown pandemic experience that already felt very... Like I remember driving to have like a Christmas lunch in my uh, my wife's parents' garden, um, and the roads were all just completely empty. Like, and there were these signs signs on the motorway saying, you know, stay at home, don't travel, and it felt like the opening of Twenty Eight Days Later or something. Like it's like, oh, well, if you made a film like that now 
actually these wouldn't be such shocking images in a way. Like there's so many things that just like everyone walking around wearing masks where hopefully in 10 years time, you're gonna have to explain why there's a period of time where everyone in the pictures is wearing masks. But like in that moment, imagining a future where everyone's having to stay in their houses and their individual bubbles isn't that shocking because that's like what we've lived through. Um, so I think it's almost, it was almost kind of flipped on its head and kind of, yeah, what's the, the radical creative act is like imagining a future where stuff has kind of worked out rather than it having not worked out in a way. If I to, you, you spoke about like walking a lot in your piece and like, I guess like, cause we were all locked inside, like walking became like a radical act or like get, getting outside, being in nature was almost like, I don't know, like, as exciting as being like in the digital space or what, it used to, what the digital space used to be. Can you like talk about like kind of, that kind of balance? Yeah, sure. Um, so during the pandemic, I was in Berlin and uh, we're a bit of a rebel city. So it wasn't as strict of a lockdown as um, everybody else had. Um, I, I think a lot of people who live in Berlin are like artists or try to be artists or, you know, believe they are. Um, so basically <laughs> it was just like, you know, people like me in Berlin and we were just, yeah, it was shocking to be on streets and they were empty, but I think we were lucky in the sense that we had a really early uh, spring last year and it was warm and people were just outside all the time. Yeah, but in terms of walking, it's um, an act that I picked up really early because in life and I always found myself asking this question of where do I belong to? How can I connect to where I found myself in the present moment? And walking was something that really grounded me. And I would feel connected with the earth and at least feel that I'm part of this place when I was doing that. It was also a chance to think of what I was working on or the ideas that I had or that I was thinking of. So in terms of the project Ancestral Wisdoms, when you ask the AI device a question, it of course doesn't know anything about you and doesn't know anything about your ancestry at the moment. Um, it is a project that I will keep working on, but what happened was that for every entry that you hear back, it's actually hours worth long of interviews that I had with these people so people talking about where they came from, what what they were wondering, what they wish they knew that they didn't know. And I found out these are questions that are really, really similar to the same questions that I was asking myself. Um, I come from a country that was deeply affected by colonization. And also then having moved a lot, I often wonder what is it about myself that I should know that I don't know. And when I would take those walks. Uh, these are the kind of questions that I would reflect on. I would, you know, run through the conversations that I've had in my mind and um, also use it as a chance to kind of um, strategize about what direction the project should go on or not. And um, actually, Berlin is an amazing city to walk in. You see all kinds of things from like really, really important history to like absolute crap. There is a thing in Berlin where people constantly give out stuff. So you could actually pick up like a brand new pair of shoes or a perfectly working printer, uh, but it could also be like, just like broken shelves, things like that. So they are in a way like also like little monuments of the city and telling stories about people's lives or you could imagine these in your mind and just being able to be in a city where you can walk in is also a blessing because a lot of people don't have that. I also grew up in Lagos and you can really not go for a leisurely walk in Lagos, you know? So it's also a chance to imagine, you know, where you where you come from, where other people are. And, you know, it's a way to like think of this connection uh, as well. So, yeah. 
about uh, like you, a lot in your work? Um, there's so many voices and a lot of family and a lot of people from abroad. How did that kind of affect your thinking throughout? Because there's people in Africa, in Europe, here in your house, at home. There's so many different emotions and, and things playing out. Like, how do you have the clarity for your own space and kind of creativity? Or do you feel like that's part of it too? Like all these other voices and inspirations? That's a good question, actually, because um, so. Uh, so Sian, I don't know if she's not here right now, but um, Sian and both Lucy, who um, helped me with everything, like, um, well, and Ali, but yeah, so who produced the project. <laughs> uh, so many people helped, so many people helped. But um, so I had this conversation with Sian, and um, I was just talking about, like, okay, so I'm interviewing this person, and then there are um, voices from the old videotapes that I want to use, um, and then there's this, and there's this, and then um, I just thought, oh, and by the way, um, what about a poem? Like, what about if I like said something? She was like, yes, like yeah, like why don't you? Um, and up until that conversation, to that point, I didn't, I didn't find it necessary. I was like, oh, it's fine. Like other people, um, and because of the editing style, I wanted everybody to. They're not in conversation, like my dad is in, in West London, you know, my other friend was like somewhere else, and Mel uh, was in Brighton. They were all in different places, right? But I wanted them to be able to like talk to each other um, because they were talking about such similar things and they didn't know each other, but like it could have been a conversation. So the way I edited it, I just chopped it up so that it kind of flowed in a way. Um, and I had taken out my own voice. So all of the questions that I was asking, um, there was, you know, I took myself out in that way. Um, and so I thought, okay, cool, I'm going to... There are poems that I'd had in my head for so long about family, um, about my granddad, you know, because I had sat with him in 2015, um, the first and only time. And there are so many questions that I didn't get to ask because of a language barrier, because I don't know Somali and he doesn't know English and I don't know Swahili. <laughs> and he knows Arabic and I don't know Arabic, so I'm the one that's like, I don't know any of your languages and my Somali's really weak. But I had poetry and I had ways to, that I could write things down and make kind of um, alternate kind of con con conclusions or I could kind of make up my own story, right? Um, so I thought, I have that. I have my head and my imagination. So let me put that in the, the story and in the, the audio. And then it felt complete in a way that it hadn't before because my, I, was, I was in there. My voice was in there. Um, and also because uh, I had a, gra um, a voice note from my granddad that I found and only remembered after he'd passed away. Um, and this was like a voice note that had travelled from um, Mombasa, where he he passed away. Um, and he passed away in, in before a couple months before COVID was like a big thing here. Um, but yeah, so I he had sent that a couple years earlier, but I only remembered it when he passed away. But I was like, wait, there is a voice note, and his voice there is his voice, and it still exists, and I need to find it. And so it took ages and hours, and we looked through everyone's phone, and I was like, somebody must have this voice note. Um, and so, yeah, I eventually found it and I just thought, I really want to preserve all of this. I want, I want there to be a space for it um, because we've, I mean, we've moved so many times, just houses in general, right, in, in London, like from house to house. And when you're moving, you lose things. There are things that you, you can't take everything with you, you know, every single move. Um, so we lost pictures and we lost like videotapes and things got destroyed. <laughs> um, and so I thought uh, this project is a way to like mark it and be like, these are the things that I want to save for now to come back to, you know, like in the future. So yeah, I hope I answered the question. I kind of went <laughs> <in places. laughs> um, We kind of spoke about, collectively, we spoke about digital preservation and protection yeah. of the yeah. stuff. Like, um, Benga, you actually had a good kind of point about if things got destroyed or how we can be creating the masses of information that we're kind of- Yeah, doing. like we, well, so we were talking about I don't know if anyone here has seen Blade Runner 2049, um, but one of the things in that that happens is like there's this massive digital pulse that wipes the world's kind of digital record, and it's a bit of a kind of year zero for a lot of things. Um, and I think we got we were talking we got onto that because we were saying, or I was saying, like in the future, digital archaeologists are going to have the opposite problem to what kind of physical archaeologists have had from time immemorial, which is like building a complete picture from scarcity. It's going to be trying to find what really happened in the midst of this mass of like, yeah, people's voice notes, all the random pictures of like, um, you know, you, you take a picture of a table to send to your partner on WhatsApp and be like, what do you think about this table? And it's like, 
Facebook or Meta, whoever, is keeping all that information somewhere. Um, and so were someone to try and build a picture of our time, it's like they're going to have these like terabytes and terabytes of data to sift through. And it's like, how are they, how's anyone ever going to have a real sense of what happened? And like, what was a meme? What was a real news story? Like once you're removed from the context of it. Um, and I think like creatively, there's a very interesting kind of space to explore with that as well. Yeah. It was kind of linking that to kind of your game production. <laughs> it's like, how, how do you kind of, do you, do you think people will look back at this time and not realize that some of the stuff that we're creating now wasn't even real? That it was like, this was a game and this was like the real thing, 8,000 years in the future. Cause that's what you're imagining. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, I guess that's, that's, a, that's an issue with a lot of science fiction is, uh, you know, like you look at Asimov or whatever, right, and, or H.G. Wells and predicting a, a future and, um, yeah, what, what, what is, what is real? <laughs> it come, comes down to, I mean, yeah, I think, I think the hardest thing will, for the future archaeologists will be to kind of work out some of the stuff like what they're kind of, there was that discovery around Pompeii just recently where, where they found a, um, supposedly a, like they call it a slave quarters and it was, it was like, it was a tiny little room and uh, it just, ha it, was, it was very complete and gave it a, a picture of a, a life that wasn't really um, talked about much because most, most of it is written records by people who who write, who are the elite, etc. So it kind of gave a, a picture of, of an actual life. Like, yeah, how do you get a picture of an everyday life when it's spread across so much information like you were talking about? Um, yeah, how do, you, how do you know that this particular, like, like the history of letter writing is that like that letter is somehow significant to both parties and, and stuff, but when you've got like I've got, I've got about a hundred thousand emails on my computer. Like, how, how would a future historian work out that this email is the email that that kind of I don't know, told me that I was uh, going to be allowed to film in this really int interesting place, and that that kind of led to all sorts of interesting ideas. And this one is just spam. Like, yeah. like that's that. There's there's sort of an equivalence of data now, which which makes makes kind of value kind of really hard to, to, to get a handle on. And I think, I think that's why there's, there, there has been such a kind of a pulling away from the digital space, I think, both with, with the kind of over-zoomification of our life through, through the, the, um, the pandemic and, um, and kind of, yeah, kind of, you know, everyone got, a, got a, like a Nintendo Switch or something, didn't they? Like, it was like, like suddenly everyone was a gamer, they were playing video games online and like, now people just want to have some sort of physical interaction and I think that's why like things like tabletop role-playing games have suddenly had a kind of resurgence is because it, it kind of necessitates that, that physical interaction and it's like all of that digitalness becomes noise and it's all about just this present moment and you actually being in there and it couldn't possibly exist without everyone who's in there and there's, there's something kind of special in that, I think. So next yeah. we've got to have a Brighton physical festival. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up. <laughs> well, but we were saying earlier, again, kind of before we started about how, so this situation we're in now, where we've got a kind of hybrid mm. physical and digital thing going on. It's like, are we going to talk about this being hybrid at all? Or is it just going to be accepted that it's not even it's not even worth commenting it's like part of what is happening is happening in the physical space and part of it is happening in the digital space some people are physically here some people are kind of a hologram kind of projected onto the space or i don't know even you know were this not a kind of slightly formal setting i'm sure most of us would kind of have our phones on the table or something and <laughs> like occasionally you just kind of go <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. I feel like even in even in those moments of 
physical interaction, which we have all been missing kind of desperately, I feel like it's still, um, yeah, there's, there's still a kind of hybrid element to it mm -hmm. if you've got some kind of device that's kind of bubbling away in the background, you know. Yeah. Amar, what you captured is like the last era of non-digital, like, like lives for people, right? I was literally thinking that while you're talking. Mm. I was literally thinking about when I was doing a residency at Lighthouse, part of my research was just chatting to people about what they have of their family members, right? And the people I was talking to, like, um, you know, like I talked to a girl who had, um, was Bengali and um, she had like letters, like she had letters from kind of her ancestry and had been like, you know, traveled with her family <coughs> on the journey. And then I had um, conversations um, with other people from different cultures who were kind of like, there's like, we don't have anything physical. Um, and, and for me, um, as a Somali person, I come from an oral tradition, as in like we pass down things through storytelling. And so there's nothing physical that's like written down, which is really, and I know a lot of us can relate, like it's, it's really, um, so things even like birth records, like my mum like does not know her actual birthday, like yeah, and awesome. yeah, and it's a quite a common thing. And so when you tell that to people, sometimes it's kind of like how, yeah, sure. um, and there there isn't that system of um, documenting things. And so when I think about like my parents, um, kind of um, and their existence and and their lives, I mean they're really important to me, right? They're really important to me, and their stories are really important to me, and I find them really interesting as people. And I, I want them to survive in that way, um, whether that's for like my future kids or like people that like I love in the future. You know what I mean? Um, because for the residency, I was also watching like a lot of films, um, and I watched some documentaries. And one was like a son doing the, an entire film about his mum, who's like a model, and I completely forgot the name. But the entire film is just about their relationship and like his memories of her. And I just thought it was a really beautiful thing that it was it was not tiny, but it was like just, you know, one relationship between, you know, a parent and a son. Um, and it was it was a whole film and it was financed and people loved it and went to the cinema to see it. And I just thought I would love to see so many of like my aunties and like my uncles and <laughs> who are really interesting and funny <laughs> people um, be written about in books or, you know, have their own writing or, you know, their voice notes or just to preserve them in that way. Um, like people telling the stories for the first time. So like when you're like asking questions, yeah. they may never have been asked it or like they've See, never that shared was, that kind of That was thing. the thing with my dad. Like when I asked him certain things about his own, um, his own father, um, he started talking in a way and he became vulnerable in a way that I had never seen before. Um, and so he was telling me things about like my granddad, oh, he was like a musician. Oh yeah, and by the way, my, my dad was like um, not raised by his parents, so he was like estranged. And I was like, oh, this is really new. And then, oh yeah, oh, and my dad, like he, he wasn't with me, he didn't raise me. And all these things start to make sense. Oh, okay, you weren't raised <laughs> by any parents. Um, things start to make sense. Things that I think we should all know um, and would have helped me <laughs> earlier in life because I'd be like, okay, cool, they haven't been raised. There are certain things that they don't get or don't understand and would save me <laughs> years of trauma. <laughs> being like, understand my pain, <laughs> understand me. Um, you know, all the things that I like tell a therapist because, you know, I've had years of having to come to, you know, this part where I just accept that we are very different people in different generations and um, I'm not going to get an apology <laughs> in certain ways because they're just so, they're just so traditional in that way and that's fine. But it, I'm still interested in why and, and, and how they got to be where they are. So, yeah. Now, someone's going to be asking you the same questions about how oh, you, yeah. Yeah. like, got from physical into digital because yeah. they will only exist knowing a digital world and that's it. Well, I think, yeah, like my um, thinking about my, so I've got two kids and my dad always says, well, so much of my life is undocumented really because it's the same thing. You know, my dad grew up in a small village in the north of Nigeria and he knows his family history kind of back two generations before him, but like, if we were to do a kind of ancestry.com type search into his background, it's like there are no written records really apart from the odd, the mm -hmm. odd thing that maybe was written down by a missionary who came through his part of Nigeria, kind of pre-colonialism type thing. Whereas my son, my, who's the older kid, it's like from the second he was born, there's a pretty much like day by day record of his life 
uh, you know, the last six and a half years type thing. And same with my daughter. And it's like, so you kind of go from one extreme of everything was oral. Um, it's a tradition that was really about like everyone in your village knew you and they knew who your parents had been and they kind of knew uh, what you guys were farmers or you were warriors, you were hunters, whatever, like you kind of had a role that your family played within the kind of society um, to like the other extreme of everything about my son's life is like readily accessible, even if I have to like you know, I backed up an old phone onto a hard drive or something. It's like, if I really go looking, I can probably find pictures of, like, most days of my son's life type thing. You know, it's like the whole other extreme. If I had to, um, like, how does, like, family play out in digital for you? Like, and that's a very um, important so, question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's really cool. Um, and it's super interesting. And uh, I've been waiting to speak a bit on what uh, Wenger and Amal have said um, about history and about oral history. Because I'm really interested. And actually, this project started because I was thinking a lot and um, looking through a lot of my granddad's archives. So my granddad started taking pictures at the age of 14 and as a hobby, but like a really serious hobby, like everything would be labeled properly and put in an album. And he always had his camera with him everywhere. And there is even like a photo of him taking a photo of his mom being put in the grave. Like that's how many images he took. And that's how like, I, I don't know if to call it a bit obsessive or not. Um, but in terms of like my own family history, there are also people in the family who are like super interested in our history. So my granddad's brother, I also recently found out in the course of working on this project that he's been doing a family tree that goes back to 300 years. And um, basically it's not only of the family, but actually like everyone in the village, like so everyone in their village is on this family tree until 2020. And um, it's super interesting. So my granddad's brother actually even tracked three people in the village who had been sold as slaves. And um, he's tracked them up to the point of, um, you know, what's called like no return, which is where the, the people who were enslaved would go on the ships. And then he found that one person didn't actually cross over and stayed and started a new family, but the two other people couldn't be tracked further. And I said to my grand uncle, like, well, this is so cool. Because on the other hand, I also have a lot of friends who are, say, from Jamaica or Brazil or Cuba. And uh, they, they wish they knew about their family. You know, they wish they knew, like, okay, what country did I come from? And actually, a few of them have done these ancestry.com tests. And um, a, a bunch of them are, like, really excited and tell me, oh, my God, I'm 58% Nigerian or whatever. And so I said to my mom's uncle, like, hey, why don't you think that like, it would be cool if we got people in the, in the, you know, on this family tree, since you've been able to do something that isn't very common to, you know, put their DNA on some sort of data bank and people who are somewhere else in the world taking these like ancestry.com tests could maybe find out, you know, who they are connected to. Um, and he just said, oh, God, it's going to be so difficult to get, you know, these village people to give their DNA to anybody. But that's besides the point, right? It's worth a try. I think um, when we were talking about who is going to get to choose what is important, what stories we should distill, it's always been people. And it's still going to be people who control these digital worlds unless, you know, the inevitable happens and the robots take over. <laughs> But I think it's up to us if we want to document our stories um, in a different format, you know, than the oral way. We have to do it. So my mom's uncle spent like a decade doing this project and going and interviewing people and asking stories. And it's not even digital, haha. <laughs> it's like a big, massive piece of paper, right? <laughs> and I would love to digitize it. Um, 
and hopefully like uh, a server is not going to go bust somewhere and then the whole thing disappears for eternity. But I think, you know, it's us who are interested in these stories, who want to collect these histories. I think um, we should feel empowered and be empowered to um, take with take it and do what we want to do with it. Um, shall I open up for questions in a minute? And um, if anyone has got like a, a question, then just, just let us know. But is there any kind of reflections for everyone, like interpersonally, that you want to share with each other? So I've, I've been like leading the questions. I have a, I have a question. I, I'm, okay, so I've had. Um Conversa okay, I didn't have this conversation with you, but you collaborated with your brother, of course, and we were talking about collaboration. I was going to kind of ask you guys, well, all, all of you guys, kind of what place does collaboration hold with the work that you do? I'll let you go first. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've found um, collaboration like essential throughout my practice, like going back to... Um, working with, with kids in youth club to form a, a dictionary of street slang, like through to um, working with Larry for the last, uh, Larry Achenpong for the last um, like eight, nine years. Like it just, I find that it creates a space in which um, kind of questions can be opened up. I can be like, things can be less precious somehow. I often, I have quite a lot of anxiety about how, <coughs> what, the, what the final project will, will be, but with, when it's in a collaboration, it's like, oh, I can try out this idea that I kind of had floating around, didn't feel like it fit, fitted with something, but it could, um, maybe it could work, work here. And um, yeah, it's been, I, I think it's, it's sort of been a good space for just completely rethinking how to make work. <laughs> So each time, because you're responding to a space, you're re responding to a whole other life, like all kind of lives if you're working with, with like a bunch of people. So um, it's, yeah, I think it's a really, really exciting and different, different way to work. Is that, is that how, how it is with your brother? Because it's like... Yeah, you, you I mean, the, so well. <laughs> the thing that was interesting about, again, the kind of lockdown Zoom type world. So my brother lives in London, but because we weren't like in a bubble together, this collaboration we did writing the story was still done kind of over Zoom. And then like we had a shared Google document that we kind of wrote the story on um, and tracked all the changes and kind of bounced ideas around. Um, but the, with a lot of my other friends who are musicians, often you'd say we should really, you know, we should work on something together and then you wouldn't actually be able to find the time to get together with them or maybe they lived in a different country and they're like oh well the next time you're passing through berlin let's do something and then that kind of never came but now it was like well no one can go anywhere so we kind of don't have any excuse not to try and do something together now and you would just kind of send files back and forth and sometimes that worked really well and stuff came out of it and other times it didn't, and that was fine. But I think it definitely kind of really ramped up the amount of... I, I felt much more open to collaboration just because uh, it was the only way... The only way that I could work with people was to kind of do things remotely. Yeah. Uh, with me, I'm just, it's just like more of a process to make so, sure something's not shit. <laughs> 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 so, um, like, when, like, putting together records or working on projects, things that I'll do by myself, it's like not, it's like not tested with people. It's just like, okay, I'm just bouncing ideas, having fun, jamming, messing around. And it's like play. And then when collaborating or working with other people or just fun, doing different projects, it, it's like work, but it's, yeah, it's still- It's more serious. Yeah, it's yeah. like fun work. Accountability, <coughs> um, we're gonna put this out. Okay, this idea, you, you do that bit. Do all the bits I don't like, and I'll do the bits I like. <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. So. <laughs> Collaboration, um, I guess it depends what it is, but that's kind of how I've used it. And, and it, for me, it's like, it means I can work on like many different things. I think if I, if, if I was primarily working um, on my own projects, um, one, I would never have released anything. And um, two, I think the, the point of which I would have felt confident some of the ideas I had were good would have taken a lot longer to get to. 
So I think when you're bouncing off someone else and they're like, okay, yeah, keep that or do that or that's a good idea, then you're like, oh, okay, like, this is kind of, this makes sense. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of... <laughs> Um, do we have any questions? Yeah, I find like yeah, yeah, collaboration yeah. amazing. I'm just, I'm just going to say that. Um, as someone who's really interested in other people's stories, I just feel like every single thing I do is a collaboration. And I love people, um, just this sense you get when someone has really been listened to and they're like, you know, something changes, you form a bond you always learn something that you never knew you were going to learn. And um, I, in some cases, on some projects that I've worked on, people have told me stuff that they've never talked about. And it's amazing for that to come out just through this process of working on projects. Thank you. Um, did we have a question? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is a question for the two of you who have worked with um, these ideas of like compiling heritage and the stories of your families together. Um, so I'm really interested in doing this very similar ideas, uh, but when it comes to digital communities, I would love to hear your thoughts in um, if you've had any encounters with compiling information from younger generations and how um, most of their lives exist in, in a digital space. This tends to be a lot more ephemeral and, and fast in, in the way that their story moves, right? Um, so yeah, I would just love to know if, if that's something that you interacted with um, when creating your projects and if there was any difference in the way that you compiled the information from younger generations compared to the um, more, I guess, like verbal, oral communication from the older generations. If it's you, you want to go first? Sure. Um, yeah. So um, I don't know if I can answer the question about, you know, the difference between the younger generations and older people. Um, but I can say that in terms of like collaborating on stuff digitally or like um, working remotely and stuff like that, I will just say like my first ever, maybe what I can call like a project. I was working with um, a group in South Africa, then I was living in London and um, they were a queer group and they were making a blog about queer people's experiences so when you're a queer person in many african countries because you cannot be out the only space you actually have to be out is the digital space so i worked with this group for five years and we never met uh, physically I, i've actually only ever met one of them once and there was a lot of us from many different countries it was called hola africa and basically we worked together um you know like always like sharing our stories of you know what it's like to be queer wherever you are you know like whatever african country you found yourself in and all this stuff um was like first it was on tumblr i basically used to live on tumblr back then like we all did if you were like a queer person um, living in an African country uh, or so you probably like mostly spending all your time online um, now there's like Instagram TikTok there are groups people we I'm still part of another group it's like an African queer group and we have like meetups we have game nights everything is online um, and we still like share our stories and and, and I you know when like lockdown came also before that I was working remotely and I was like having Zoom calls all the time. I already hated it anyway. Um, so I've like basically spent a lot of my time like, you know, like living online or being connected to the internet. And I think it's really cool to be able to collaborate digitally because you can reach um, things that you can have reached before, you know, like I can have gone to South Africa or all these other people can have come to wherever I was for us to be able to work on projects together. Um, we also recently uh, released a book. Um, so yeah, you can just digitally, that's what I can say. Yeah, yeah I, I can't add to anything much more than that really, but um, I would say that also, for me, it's also about just respecting like all the different ways that, you know, the archive exists, all the different methods that we have. And I know Fatu talked about Tumblr, but like I love a blog and I love like having archives in that way um, and I really love going back to people's kind of older text and seeing you know 
where that kind of came from. Um, I had like a workshop with younger people recently, and but this was photography, um, and we were working with selfies, and we were having conversations about kind of how they saw themselves, how they like documented themselves, and just things like using their phone and taking pictures and making like little photo albums of themselves. Um, so yeah, I would just say yeah, respecting all those kind of ways that a, a person can like document themselves. But yeah, I can't add much more than that really. But yeah, good luck with your project. Okay, do you have another? Where is it? Where's Ali? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, do you not think there's a danger in the inverse? Um, um, perhaps Benga's child, who's been recorded every single day of his life, may not like that when he grows up. And in, certainly in terms of um, artistic expression and freedom, I feel constant surveillance of digital technology is perhaps has a negative impact. And maybe the oral tradition where a story could be told while looking in the whites of someone's eyes over a pint is, has a value that's very different from a complete digital archive. I just wonder if you were, um, I guess the question specifically is, is there room for humanity in a constantly surveilled digital space? It's an interesting question, which I have often thought about, um, because, yeah, I, so I'm, I'm very wary of putting any pictures of my son onto my social media, for example. Um, like, my wife has a kind of private social media page, so she posts stuff about our family, but it's kind of just to people that we know kind of thing, or people she works with or whatever. Um, and I definitely have this sense that a lot of our kids will get to their kind of, if you've got young kids, they might get to their early teens and suddenly really not like the idea that they, there's this kind of record of them online that they had no consent or gave no consent to. Um, and then, so my brother and I are writing more stories and like in one of the stories that we're working on at the moment, there is this, um, there is a, a constant digital record, but basically it doesn't belong <coughs> to any corporation. Um, basically, all the all the technology that has been used to build the kind of social media space is publicly <coughs> owned, um, and so even stuff like uh, you can find anyone at any time in this world. Um, but because you can kind of find anyone at any time, there's this kind of mutually assured destruction where if anyone can find you at any time, you don't want to look into what other people are doing because you don't want them doing it to you, basically. Um, and so you have this almost kind of um, this civil agreement that you don't look into other people's business unless you're willing for them to look into your business. And so no one looks into anyone else's <laughs> business, which I know is a very kind of utopian, <coughs> utopian view. But part of, part of what gives rise to that in the story is the fact that you don't have companies like Google and Facebook kind of mining your data for advertising. So it's basically like there's a digital space, but there's no advertising, really. Um, so yeah, I I guess like that that has definitely come out of an anxiety that I think we all feel about not just for our kids but like for ourselves too, kind of having volunteered to be part of the Panopticon basically, mm -hmm. um, and like what that means for um, yeah like our personal freedom and the kind of yeah the the integrity of human connections. Do you think um, people will be more like this? Like me and Amal just met today, but we met on Zoom, and that connection on Zoom was as real as online because of what we were talking about and going through at that time. So it's hard to have a distinction for me now, even that you know, if I was sitting opposite someone having a pint, that would be like more important than say like some of the conversations or work I've been able to do online, maybe you have like different relationships and there might be a point where you can say, well, the relationships I had in real life were le like less real than to some of the, the kind of depth that I've been able to get with the people online. Um, so I don't know, I don't want to look at it as verses, but 
Yeah. Like no, a... I, I know what you mean. Like it's it's also so it's not it's very much not like being part of a queer community online. But like I remember when I when I was like in my late teens, early twenties, into my mid twenties, like I'd spend a lot of time on music forums and like on MySpace pages for people who were like into the same bands that I was and we had this very kind of intense uh intense online relationship where they'd be like, I hate my job, out of my friends, I'm the only person who listens to my chemical romance. And like the only other people who understand how much I love my chemical romance are like my friends online. Like very occasionally if they were playing at, uh, you know, if they had a show in London, you'd meet up at the My Chemical Romance concert with all, all your people. Um, and you very much felt like they were your people more than the people that you saw every day when you were going to your job or like the people that you were sharing a house with or whatever. Um, but then I guess it's more that there was a kind of 50-50 between the digital space and the real space because mm. it was kind of, yeah, before everything was kind of mediated by having your phone there the whole time. I think we're able to like comp compartmentalize parts of ourselves to only share that bit, like if it's just my chemical romance. Yeah, yeah, that's and true. It's like, okay, so it stops there. And then when you start talking about Newcastle Football Club, they just tune out. They're like, oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> what's this guy on? Yeah. It just, it just goes left. You know what I mean, it just goes left. Um, yeah. Sorry. But yeah, just as you're saying, like you couldn't tell me when I was younger that kind of like my online friends or my community that I'd never met were not like my real life people, right? Like there was, for me in my head, there was no um, distinction and also it kind of blurred a lot. Like sometimes the people that I met, say on Tumblr or Twitter, became my actual real life friends because I'd see them somewhere or like we'd make it a thing. If I was like in your city or they were in my city, we'd, we'd make it a thing to meet up. Um, but that doesn't mean that sometimes, um, like recently I was telling like, me and my husband are talking about this and I was like I didn't realize I am really fiercely private like fiercely private like I want to always protect my closest people which is weird because I'm a poet and I talk a lot about my family and I take a lot of pictures of the people around me but I didn't realize until now actually there are things that I have to put in place mentally like there has to be permission from people there there has to be a conversation about by the way this is what happens to the picture that I take, or to my knowledge, it's gonna might go on Instagram. Are you okay with that? So there are all these conversations that I have to have with people, and even then, I'm nervous because I'm like, oh my god, I'm putting them on a public platform, and then after that point, people are gonna interact with it in the way that they want to interact with it, and I can't protect them anymore in that way. And so I have also kind of negotiated my online presence, you know, in the last year and a half, where. There are so many things that I just don't post about and you won't know like where I am, you don't know where I live, but here's my work um, in a general place that's like green, um, that could be anywhere, right? Um, and also even when we talk about like heritage and when we talk about like turning it from like an oral tradition into something that's more kind of you know documented, it scares me a lot of the times as well because it's like I'm already so visible and a lot of the people that I love are already so visible in the state that we're in right now, right? Um, the state can use the things, those things against you, um, can, you know, use it, you know, can surveil you, can, you know, like all the things that we believe in, all the things that we post online are just kind of not really innocent things to a lot of the people that I know. You very much have to negotiate what you put online, you know, because it can affect your livelihood in that way. But um, yeah, anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking all the time about like even DNA. <laughs> right? Like there are so many stories of kind of like the state using your DNA against you or kind of connecting you with things or planting things. I'm such a conspiracy theorist at, at times, but I'm like these things sometimes are not um, innocent, you know, like they, they go in a database and then, you know, police have access to them, um, people have access to them, you know, that we don't know. It's kind of beyond our control. So yeah, th those things are kind of scary to me sometimes. I'm like, what do you do? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> And that's where we finish. <laughs> <laughs> what a bleak ending. I do not want it to be a bleak ending. <laughs> but yeah. Is there any other question? Uh, hi. Uh, hey. Thank you for your um, discussions. And I think the thing that was coming up for me that maybe the dialogues were hovering around was... Um, this kind of historical amnesia that we see kind of worldwide, but also 
in our cultural spaces or um, in our movements even, in a sense that like people face these issues and they start organizing together and it seems like a whole brand new world with its new challenges and what's missing is like the lineage of people who've been doing the thing that you've been doing beforehand. We do this in art as well because it's like the artists that came before us, the musicians that came before us. So, um, yeah, I think it's just so amazing that you're doing the job of collecting these things and creating something out of them. And um, maybe the question is, how do we keep making it accessible to people when they need it? And how do we keep making it engaging so that it's not lost among other things? That's it. That's that's a deep one, Elijah. Like throwing me under the bus. <laughs> um, I, I find that a really interesting question, and I guess in terms of accessibility, um, that's like in one sense where I really appreciate social media, although it has like it's a really really terrible side, with us not knowing what's being done with our data, but. Um, I remember like engaging with social media, like, you know, being a young person and it was just like a place where you can put stuff and potentially um, anyone can see it if it's open, you know, all you have to do is to have um, internet access. And of course that is still a barrier to many people in many parts of the world, but at least it was something that kind of was a bridge. Um, so again, it's like going back to digital. I really see digital as a space um, that can be more accessible than a lot of the other spaces that we've had in the past or that we've been able to create in the past. Um, I also think accessibility is about um, other perspectives, other points of views um, that are not mainstream. I, I find that really important. Um, I don't know if other people want to add to that. I think the issue, Maybe. yeah, the, the issue of access kind of, yeah, there, there are two components to it, I guess. I think one is like the, like literally like internet access, you know, like in, in the, my dad's village, for example, um, this place called Isalum in a state called Kogi, like kind of in the north of Nigeria, like still, they don't have constant electricity and they definitely do not have much of a phone signal there and consequently if you want to do if i wanted to do a video call with one of my my dad's brother who lives near there or like if i'd wanted to do that with my my dad's mum before she died that just isn't something we'd have been able to do and uh if i wanted to like send her a link to watch my band's newest video or whatever not a thing she'd have been able to do and i think like if you're a young person growing up in a place like that um and you wanted to like google questions about nigeria's history questions about the colonial past like that information is still not really going to be that accessible to you because you like have to go to an internet cafe and like sit and like pay someone to like use a computer and if you're going to do that you're going to be on Facebook. You're not going to be Googling <laughs> questions of colonial history or whatever. Um, so, I mean, I do think like that's, uh, that is still a kind of um, global north, global south kind of disparity. Um, I don't really know what the suggestion, what the kind of solution to that is. Um, I do know like there are, there are lots of charities that do work about kind of providing internet access to like more and more remote places and on one level, you think there are more important problems to be solving in the world, um, but in another sense, I actually think that access is so important just for that thing of being a young person who's got a different perspective on the world or wants to explore different options for different things you can believe, different ways you can be, um, different kind of sexual options, whatever. Um, 
and just being able to like see different possibilities is a very kind of powerful thing, I think. David? Yeah, I was, I mean, I was wondering in terms of accessibility, whether you meant like its form, I mean, there's, there's obviously the accessibility of, of the, um, the actual, the archive or whatever, like how do you, how do you access that thing? But then there's also, how do you make that thing legible so that it exists and makes sense without, say, I don't know, you being next to the work or whatever. And that's, that's kind of part of the, our work as artists is kind of making something that exists separate from us, that is a thing. And, and it's a very, it's, it's a complicated thing because you want to give enough information, you want to give the kind of context, but you also want to give the space for it to exist and make sense in that thing. So, I mean, that's, that's our job, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I think every every artist approaches that in a different way. Like, and some things, you know, is that is that thing of you know how do you not erase the reality and the humanity of the the, the subject that you're dealing with, and you know, which is something that often happens in in a kind of may, maybe a more commercial project or like kind of a, an official documentary or something. It's like people stop being people, they start being just like subjects or, or kind of voice notes or like um, a, some sort of uh, yeah, sound bite. But you know, in, in art, we want to try and actually capture kind of a wholeness of a, a situation, a kind of a reality and, um, and hold that in this, in this space, whether that's digital, or analog or whatever. So. Yeah. That's it, questions wise. All right, well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, thanks everyone for sharing everything. Um, we're gonna, I'm up, um, sorry, if I tell you, we're gonna uh, be here having a little party. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry to let, leave you out of that side of things. But thank you for joining us from right. Berlin. <laughs> thank um, you so much, have a drink on me. <laughs>